Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Trusted CI webinar for May 21st, uh, 2018. I'm your host, Jeanette Dopheide. Trusted CI is the NSF Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, and these webinars are part of its mission to deliver high quality, actionable guidance regarding cybersecurity to the NSF community. More information about Trusted CI can be found at trustedci.org. Today's topic is the EU General Data Protection Regulation, uh, with, uh, also known as GDPR, with Trusted CI Scott Russell. Before we begin, I have a few items to note. First, the presentation is being recorded. Second, participants are welcome to ask questions during the session using the chat box. So if you click on the chat icon, uh, you can type your questions here. And uh, we encourage you to ask questions during the presentation, uh, but we also plan on saving time at the end of pre the presentation to get through any, any leftover questions. And with that introduction, I will hand things over to Scott. I'm going to stop sharing. Scott, welcome. Thank you. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, as you've heard, my name is Scott Russell. I am a senior policy analyst at CACR, the Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research, and I am also on Trusted CI. I am a lawyer. I work in privacy and cybersecurity. I normally don't do European Union issues, but since the European Union is increasingly sort of reaching their hands into uh, our business, I am increasingly aware of it in recent years. All right, so a quick roadmap of the talk I'm gonna be giving today. I will be talking about the European Union General Data Protection Regulation, or GDPR. Uh, you know, just quick intro, overview of the topic area. There's gonna be a big focus on the scope of application, basically who does the law apply to, and if the law might apply to you, strategies to apply. I'm also going to leave some time at, quest at the end for questions. I will just notice, I will just note that I'm not going to go into too many of the nitty gritty details about the law because there are a lot of them. The law is very big, it's very complicated. And if you are covered by it, there's just going to be a lot that you're going to have to do. So instead of going into those, I'm going to focus on big ticket items. So sort of how you should think about the law, how you should approach it. Okay, so just a quick overview of the law for people who maybe aren't familiar. What is GDPR? It is, in short, a very big privacy law. The European Union has done this before. They tend to value privacy and regulate it a bit more than we do here in the US. And this is probably their most ambitious effort, and maybe the most ambitious ever, effort of anyone to regulate privacy. Who is potentially covered? This is one of the big points here. The entire world. Even though this is a European Union law, they are not limiting the scope of application to just the European Union. We're going to go into this into much greater detail, but this is one of the reasons this has become such a big issue. Another reason why this is such a big issue is that how much is at stake is 4% of global annual turnover. This is kind of an unusual uh, cost to talk about, but this is basically 4% of revenues. So this is enormous. These are very big fines. And for smaller organizations where 4% might not seem like that much, they have an alternative of 20 million euro, which is they can also opt for. When does the law come into effect? Uh, Friday. Uh, we've known about this for roughly two years, but uh, if your internet traffic is any, or if your email traffic is anything like mine, you're probably getting a lot of panicky uh, news bites talking about are you in compliance or not. So uh, if you should start panicking, uh, I will not comment on that. All right, so before I go into the law, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the motivations for why we're having a new EU privacy law. Because as some of you might know, there is a current law in the EU called the Data Protection Directive, and that sounds pretty close to data protection regulation. So the motivation here is that under the current law, each EU member state, which is like a Germany or an Ireland, they write their own law, but there's like a template that the whole EU uses. And one of the big uh, features of this is that within the EU, they have to allow data transfers to the various member states. So what ended up happening is the classic race to the bottom. Every big tech company sets up shop in the state with the least restrictive regulations. And in this case, that was Ireland. Almost every major tech company sets up its shop for the European Union in Ireland, 
And that means that the Irish Data Protection Authority has a lot of power. And the EU basically wants to fix this because if you are not in Ireland and you maybe have different standards of privacy, being subjected to Ireland's standard doesn't seem very fair to you. So GDPR is trying to set up an EU-wide standard and they're also creating an EU-wide data protection authority. So each individual member state, you know, the Germans and the Irelands, they each keep their data protection authority, but now there's an EU-wide one that's sort of a, a higher level of authority. And while this is mostly an EU issue, this is actually important because this is kind of a good thing if you have to deal with European Union law, because now there's just one law rather than a bunch of them you might have to deal with. Okay, the second point here is GDPR is trying to ensure their privacy everywhere, not just in the EU. Now this is in particular talking about EU citizens' data privacy rights. So the problem here is that data is just really easy to move and the past law only applied directly on EU soil. Now th this might seem kind of commonsensical, but this is how most laws apply, right? It's the land that you are standing on is the most important thing determining whose laws you are subject to. So I'm sitting in Indiana, I'm subject to Indiana law. If Idaho tried to like bring me into court, I could just you know say, no, you, you don't have authority, you can't do that. The problem here is that because data is so easy to move, you can just move it out of the state. So it takes me a while to get to Idaho. It does not take data a long time to get to Idaho. And the way the European Union tried to deal with this was restrict where you could send data. But then they made exceptions to this and ultimately the whole framework didn't work. So the new law says explicitly that it applies basically anywhere, regardless of the land. And while this is a little uncommon, it's not unheard of. The US does this sometimes too. If strictly territorial laws, you know, just within our land doesn't work as a regulatory regime, we will say explicitly that this applies overseas as well. And the third point is probably the most vague, but it's one of these strong motivators. And that's just that the internet has changed a lot in the 20 years since the last EU privacy law. And there are tech companies that are just very big and very powerful. And there's this strong sense that we want to empower data subjects, right? The sort of you and me, regular people, relative to these tech companies. Okay, so this next one is broad points about how I think about the law, sort of from an interpretive standpoint. So again, these are my emphasis, but I think they're useful. So the first is that this law basically shifts the paradigm to illegal unless specifically legal with regard to data processing. So in the US, you know, normally we think about things and say, well, we can do things unless the, the government says we can't, right? And that's the way data processing is applied as well. It's legal unless they specifically say, I mean, it's legal unless they specifically say it's illegal. This is gonna try and shift that, just completely invert the paradigm and say, if you're going to do any data processing, you have to be able to point to a lawful processing type. So I give some examples here. We'll talk about this in more detail, but consent, uh, legitimate interest is another big one. And this says, if you can't point to one of these types, you just can't do the data processing. So that's a pretty big change. Uh, the second one, or the second and third points kind of go together. Again, there's this empowering data subjects where we want to like inform them. We want to give them greater access, give them rights about how they can change data. But also we want the burdens to fall on data controllers and data processors, right? The Facebooks and the Googles, these sort of big companies that deal with all the data and not have the burdens fall on data subjects. So an example in like US law, we might say, if you wanna change data, the burden, the burden is put on you to prove that the data they have is wrong. And under the EU framework, we're gonna switch that. And if you show up and say that data is wrong, the burden is on the controller or the processor to prove that it's right. And the final two points kind of go together as well. The first is this broadness point where basically GDPR has a tendency to draw very broad definitions for almost all of the terms it uses. I have, I've skipped a lot of the definitions, but I can go into them if you have questions. And one of the reasons behind this is that they want to avoid sort of technical circumvention, which is really common in the sort of tech space where you will create laws, but we'll have little loopholes in them and then the technology makes it so they can just exploit those loopholes. So they try to avoid that by going very broad. And a sort of byproduct of this is that the law becomes very vague. We just, we don't really know what all of the terms mean. There's a lot that's sort of left for future litigation 
And part of it also is just that there are just difficult competing goals that this law is trying to accommodate. You know, we're dealing with privacy and free speech, these sort of big concepts. And it's hard to get those right without leaving the wording a little bit vague. And I'll show you some examples of this. All right, so finally, these are sort of the questions I think you should use when approaching the law, how you should think about it. So step one, just am I covered? This is sort of like the big ticket. If I'm not covered, I don't need to worry about anything else. Great, that's kind of what everyone wants. I don't wanna seem like I'm too anti-GDPR, but there's a lot here. And it would definitely be easier on organizations if you don't have to do it. In fact, this point is so important that I'm going to skip it in greater detail and save it for the end because we're gonna give it a fair amount of time. Okay, but if you are covered by the law, the first question is, can I even do my processing at all? Because like we said before, you have to be able to point to a lawful processing type to justify doing it. So there's a good chance, maybe not a good chance, but there is a chance that you might have a certain type of data processing that you currently do that you just can't do anymore because the law doesn't allow it. So you need to learn these different processing types to see if you can even do it. And then if you can do the processing type, you then have to say, all right, then what are the requirements that come with that processing type? There's a lot of uh, procedural details that we'll get into. There's also general requirements if you are covered under the law that you're going to have to comply with. And then what happens if I don't comply, right? What are the sort of the penalties? How do the penalties actually apply? You know, what is the sort of procedural details of that? Points three and four are really the big ones here. This is where the kind of the meat of the law and that's also where a lot of the burden comes from. Okay, so like I said, we're, uh, we're skipping over if you are covered with the law by the law just for right now. We'll get back to that later. So this is going into the various lawful processing types. So in general, you need to be able to point to one of these if you want to do any data processing at all. So obviously we've got consent on here. Consent is sort of the big privacy catch-all because it's privacy, it's an individual right. If the person you know, consents to it, it's okay, right? It comports with their privacy. Um, we also have, you know, Fulfillment of performance of a contract. These can be a little, a little bit technical, but you know, if you are like, if you are giving data to a bank to do something, they might be able to say, well, look, I need to do a couple of other things with your data in order just to do these banking services that I contracted with. There's also compliance with legal obligations. This kind of means like if the government tells you to collect data, then obviously it should be okay for, you know, GDPR because it's under the same regime. I will note though, that when they talk about compliance with legal obligations, they're talking generally about EU or EU member state laws. They don't specifically talk about US law. So it's not totally clear what happens here if you have compliance with a US law that maybe conflicts with the GDPR. That's one of the uncertainties. Presumably they would be okay with that, but it's hard to say, especially if you're talking about you know, sort of like national security interest type issues where the EU has had a lot of concerns with the US approach. All right, there's also protection of vital interests of a natural person. These tend to be a little bit narrow, but they add them here just as a sort of catch all. You know, if someone's life is in danger, a lot of times the rules change. There's also public interest, official capacity. This is probably not going to apply to anyone here. This is if you are like, you know, a public authority you will often have just more rights than a private company, and particularly an EU public authority. And the final point, legitimate interest, seems like it's kind of a catch-all. This is the, we don't really want to delineate everything that's okay, we just want to make sure that like legitimate interests are okay. So this is something that's probably going to be elucidated more in like court cases, or the individual uh, data protection authorities might give out like guidance documents that'll just explain some of the things that fall under this. So like advertising is something that's been brought up as a potential legitimate interest, as long as it's not targeted. Targeted advertising is treated a little bit differently. Okay, so a few other important points. If you collect data for one purpose, and then you want to use it for another purpose, you can't just say, well, they consented to one purpose, therefore I'm good. You have to be able to basically point to another one of these lawful processing types for the different type of processing. So if they consent for one thing, you might have to go back and ask them for consent on another thing. Or you might need to be able to say, well, this other thing is a legitimate interest, or maybe it 
it's part of the contract that we made in the initial exchange, something along those lines. But again, you need to justify it. And uh, finally, you'll see there are special rules for special types of data. All right, so as we can see here, there are a lot of particularly privacy sensitive types of data that basically have special rules. And again, we're still talking about if you can do the processing at all. So if we're dealing with personal data that reveals racial, ethnic origin, political opinions, trade union membership, religious, philosophical, right? I mean, there's a lot of you know, privacy sensitive things on here. And they basically say, all right, there are lawful processing types for pretty much all of these but they're stricter. It's like, it's harder to get consent on one of these things. They might be more narrow on sort of like what you can get them to consent to. Maybe you have to say very, very specifically what we are doing this processing for. And again, the rules just, they're a little bit tighter when you're dealing with special categories of data. I'm not going to go into all any of these in great detail. I think the main point you should just take away here is that if you are going to be doing data processing, you need to be able to point to a good reason why you're doing that data processing. It's no longer good enough just to do it, which is kind of the US approach. Okay, so now that we're assuming that the processing that you're doing is lawful, you point it to your justification, what does the law require you to do? All right, so the first big category here is you have to facilitate user rights, basically. As you can see, users get a whole bunch of rights from this law. Not all of them are as clear as you know, we might like, but it should give you a flavor for just the types of things that you're going to need to do. And I'm gonna go through these a little bit quicker. So transparency, a lot of this is just, they, if you are a data controller or a data processor, you have to give information about what you're going to do with data. You have to tell them what you're going to use it for, how long you're going to keep it, things like that. Uh, there is a right for controllers to facilitate your rights. This one's a little vague, but it basically, like the specific example they've given is that data controllers or processors cannot retaliate against you if you actually enforce your rights. If you say, I want to change data that I think is wrong, and they try and take like some sort of discriminatory action against you, that would be a violation of the law. You have a right to be informed. This is again, just basically controllers and processors have to give over a lot of data. Um, I won't list it all, but again, it's like what data they're collecting it, what are they collecting it for, how long, who they're going to transfer it to, how those transfers work. And th this is all information that has to be provided. You have a right to access your data. So if they have data, they have to tell you, and then they, you have to be able to get it. You have a right to rectify data, which basically means I can change something that's wrong. And changing something that's wrong can include adding more data to it so you might say, there's this little bit of data that's taken out of context. I think you need to add more stuff to it in order to make it fully flush out the picture. From a data processor's perspective, that might be really challenging because that other data that they want to add to rectify it might be in your mind, it's like a totally different kind, but you still have to do it. There is a right to restrict processing. This is sort of a uh, procedural safeguard. When there's a dispute, you can say, I've raised a problem stop all processing until that data um, dispute is resolved. The other way this could arise is if they have a right to delete data, which we'll get to in a second, they might also say, I have a right to delete data, but I would rather you just never process it. You just you hold it, but you don't process it. And in that case, you just have to hold it and not process it. There are specific rights regarding automated decision-making. This is like algorithmic decision-making basically. And um, again, I won't go into the details here. They, um, they're complicated. They're kind of hard to decipher. There's, um, there's some unusualness with uh, marketing where you can, if you are trying to subject someone to automated targeted advertising, they can just opt out of that completely and they can do it in an automated way. So they can like download a, a web app that says automatically reject any automated uh, targeted advertising and you just have to do it. There is the right to erasure, which some of you may have heard as the right to be forgotten. This was a, a pretty big news item when it came out from the EU, because it really, literally means that data just has to be erased. And it's gotten a little bit more complicated than this. There's, uh, they provide a calculus that basically says, we're balancing the right of the individual, you know, the data subject to have the data deleted versus the public interest in the data versus a couple of other things. 
But as a processor and a controller, you now have to entertain these rights. And uh, finally, there's a right to data portability. This is one of the, uh, the big new things in the law that basically says uh, data controllers, you know, sort of like a Facebook, has to be able to take all of your data, package it in a nice little box, and hand it over to competitors if you would like them to. So we don't really know how this is going to work in practice. I mean, they, they sort of mention that, like, well, as far as it's feasible, you know, it's something they would like to happen. It's not clear how easy this will be. It's not totally clear what form it'll take, but the general idea is that your data, you should be able to pick it out, pick it up from controllers and hand it to someone else as a sort of a way to facilitate competition. You know, we don't want one actor just to have total hegemony and there's no way for another Facebook to come up. All right, so what else does law require? As you can see, text is getting smaller because there's a lot. Again, there's these notice requirements about you know, what you have to tell. Um, this is you as a data processor controller, what you have to tell data subjects. There are security requirements. Generally, this just boils down to you have to take reasonable security precautions given the circumstances. So not super stringent, but it's also not totally clear what those mean. So potential for, uh, for more stuff to come up in that context later. All right, so there's a requirement for you to have a representative in the EU if you are a non-EU controller or processor. This one is potentially relevant, I think, particularly to this audience, because this is specific for if you are not in the EU, right? You're like a US company, but you think you're covered by GDPR. The provision says you have to have a representative somewhere in the EU so that if people basically have sort of complaints, they want to file lawsuits, they have someone in the EU they can go to. Now I will note, this doesn't apply to everyone, and this is where it gets kind of confusing. So it doesn't apply to processing that is occasional, not on a large scale. So sort of if you were just, you're kind of minding your own business, but you're kind of covered by GDPR, they'll say, okay, you don't need to have this uh, representative in the EU. And as you can see here, if it's unlikely to result in risk to the rights and freedoms of natural persons, taking into account nature, context, scope, and purposes of the processing, this is the kind of language the EU loves to throw in which is sort of their catch-all, well, it, you know, we don't really want to, we don't want to tell you necessarily, but we want you to go through the sort of calculus of, you know, are we really impacting privacy in such a way that we need to have the representative? So not totally clear what this will mean at a practical level, but it's a good thing to keep in mind. Similarly, this one is, I think, much less likely to apply, is the data protection officer. Now, this is a role that organizations are required to implement if they carry out certain types of processing. Now you'll note here, it's basically large scale monitoring, large scale processing of data. If you were acting like a public body, basically people who are going to have a considerable impact on privacy, you have to create this office, you know, an officer called a data protection officer or a DPO. Now there's a whole lot of stuff about these that I basically skipped because most likely I'm guessing for this audience, this is not going to be a, uh, a relevant requirement, but it's a good thing to keep in mind if you were like, you know, doing lots of human research data, you know, on uh, people in the EU, maybe this applies. Uh, there are recording requirements where basically you have to be able to point, if someone comes in and asks, tell me all of the kinds of data processing you were doing, you have to be able to point to all of those along with a couple other things. Basically for all the requirements, you're gonna have to prove that you're doing them. Breach notification requirements, I think we're all kind of familiar with those. Uh, data impact assessments, these are kind of like, if you're doing something that looks like it might have a particular impact on privacy, you have to do a certain type of assessment and you have to write it down. Sometimes you might have to go to a data protection authority and say, I did this thing, we think it's okay, but you have to get them to sort of like sign off on it. Data protection by design, this is a, a very difficult concept to really understand. It's sort of like security by design, privacy by design. It's, it's a good idea. There's some language in here saying you're supposed to do it when feasible. It's not clear if it's really a requirement or if it's just uh, a uh, motivation to you know, take steps to try and ensure privacy better. And, and then there's more, like I say, transfer restrictions, there's contract requirements, there's certification authorities that are going to start popping up in the next couple of years. Those are going to be uh, member state specific. So like Germany might have different certification requirements than Ireland. 
but we don't have a whole lot of information on that yet. So I'm just marking those as something to be aware of. And this is just kind of for fun. If you would like to have an example of what this law looks like in practice, it's almost all paragraphs like this, right? This is just one article, you know, one subsection of an article. And uh, it's rough. Uh, I, I won't actually go through and read it all. I, I thought about it, but as you can see, it's, it has a lot of language where it's taking into account things, you know, it's, it's balancing. It's, it can be difficult to really parse. And a lot of this is adds to the vagueness point that I brought up earlier. Okay, so a few more things. This is again talking about what's required of, by the law. There are some special rules for research. This just means if you are doing something in the public interest, you're doing scientific or historical research, the rules are a little bit different. Now, I note this does not mean that the law does not apply. It just means that some of the rules are a little bit less strict. So, you know, like storage limitation requirements aren't gonna be as strict because you are doing storage, you know, archival purposes in the public interest, obviously you're probably gonna be holding data longer than some other people. So again, this is a salve, not a remedy. You're still subject to a lot of things. The law just might be a little bit more lenient. And then just briefly, uh, talking about the formal penalty structure, they're a little bit complicated. There's two big categories. So there's 2% global annual turnover and 4% global annual turnover. It looks like the 4% covers most of the big things. You know, the 2% is for a little bit more niche issues. And with all of these, these are maximums. So there's probably going to be a lot of discretion in exactly how much is brought. It's like, you know, in, in the US, when we, we have penalties, there's often a very big ticket number at the top, you know, like reckless driving fines up to $5,000 or something like that. But normally that doesn't happen unless you are like egregious in your uh, violation of the law. Another important point is there's joint and several liability. So if you're in a joint venture, venture like you were a data controller, but you also have some data processors and you think the data processor was really at fault, you can both be held liable for all of it. And then what you have to do is basically sue your data controller or data processor to try and recover the part that you paid. And a lot of this is going to be fleshed out by member states because the member state data protection authorities are the ones who are going to do most of the enforcement. Okay, so now we're going to go into kind of like the money issue of scope of application. Does this apply to me? So who is regulated by the law? The law basically lays out three big categories of people that it covers. And there's data controllers and processors in the EU who process personal data. This is sort of like the obvious example. Like if you were a, a German Facebook, you were subject to the German privacy law. And they note it's regardless of whether processing, processing happens inside the EU or not. So even if you have like an affiliate in the US, that doesn't, you, that doesn't exempt you, right? You're, you're based in the EU, you are subject to the EU's laws. Pretty non-controversial. Number three, I'm gonna hit briefly because it's not particularly important. This is if you are subject to EU law because of public international law. This is kind of a I feel like this was put in as like a bookend. It's probably not particularly relevant to anyone, but it's just good to have, bear in mind that there's this sort of third prong. It's the second one that's really important. And that is if you were a data controller, not in the EU, but who, now this is gonna sound very lawyerly, I apologize. If you process personal data of data subjects in the union and either offer goods and services to data subjects in the EU, regardless of payment, or you monitor the behavior of data subjects in the EU, all right, so we'll break that down a little bit. So you're a data controller or a data processor, which really is almost anyone who handles data. So those are very broad terms. You're not in the EU, so like in the US, but if you process personal data of data subjects in the union, so you're processing the data of someone in the EU, right? There's, you know, Sam over in Germany and he has some data and you're processing it. Okay, prong one is covered. And you either, and it's these last two points that are really the kickers, you either offer goods or services to data subjects in the EU, right? So you like hold up like a shop, you have like an internet website and you say, we are offering to sell things to people in Germany. That would be a pretty clear example of someone who is offering goods or services to data subjects in the EU. Or you monitor, monitor the behavior of data subjects in the EU. So if you have like an app, and you, um, you get in data from a lot of places. And so you're like looking at like 
you know, you have like a Fitbit and you're watching how people run all around the world, you are monitoring their data. So even if you are not explicitly offering goods and services to them, the fact that you are monitoring is enough to get you covered by the law. So let's break this down a little bit further because I think the first one is the one most people are more concerned about. And that is, do I offer goods or services to the EU? And this is one of those big points of uncertainty with the law because under a very narrow interpretation, you might say, well, goods and services that, you know, there should be like an exchange of dollars or something like that, or Euro in this case. Whereas others, which is, looks like it's the more correct interpretation is really any good or service. So if you have a website that just provides information and you make money based on advertising, something like that, but you are offering this, you are potentially offering a service to the EU just by allowing access to your website. So you can sort of see that there's a broad range of interpretation that could be applied to this. So luckily we have a little bit more information and this is drawn from the previous law, but which we think still applies because of some complicated EU governance provisions that I'm not going to get into. Where basically it cites case law around envisaging. So this is a great lawyerly word again, you know, did you envisage that you would be offering goods or services to the EU? So basically under this framework, it would say, it's not enough if it's just possible for EU persons to reach your site, right? And most of what we're talking about here is gonna be websites. So mere accessibility is not enough. There needs to be something more that shows that you don't, you're not just accessible, but that you sort of anticipated that people in the EU would be using, would be, you know, getting your goods or services. So they give you some examples. These are not really, this is not still not as clear as we'd like it to be, but there are some pretty clear ones of offering uh, the site in EU languages, right? If you have a button where you can say switch to German, that's, you know, pretty clear that you're thinking we might have German customers. If you mention EU customers specifically, you know, if you have specific ways you accept EU currency, so there's some options here. And in some ways this can be good news because there's a, I mean, there's a little bit of clarity here where you might say, well, we're accessible, but we're not really envisaging. You might say, you know, we're, we are open to the whole world. We want anyone to be able to see our site. You know, it's the great part about the global internet, but we weren't specifically, we weren't like targeting the EU. We weren't, you know, holding out our services specific to them, which means, there maybe you can say, well, the launch doesn't apply to me. You know? So I come up with a couple of scenarios where you might be covered. Uh, Scott, sorry, uh, if we could just pause for a second here. Sure. What are what are subjects in the EU? Are they U.S. citizens visiting the EU? Excellent question. Sorry. Um, yes, this is uh, not again. Not everything is totally clear here, but. Um, it talks about EU persons, which basically means any person in the EU. So if you are an EU citizen in the EU, obviously, if you are an EU citizen not in the EU, right, you're an EU citizen in the US, those are not covered. So an EU citizen comes over and like uses credit cards or something, that would not be covered. If you are a US person in the EU, you are covered to the extent that it relates to, so like, this can be a little bit complicated. So if you were, you know, it's not like if I go overseas and every company who has data on me is suddenly covered by GDPR, that wouldn't be the way this works. But if when I'm in the EU, the sort of offering of goods or services happens, then that would, that would apply. So it's just any person in the EU. Does that answer the question? I believe so, but we'll, we'll allow uh, the person to uh, ask more questions if they need to. But you can continue. Okay. So um, scenarios where you might be covered. This is um, th this is obviously not going to be comprehensive. I was just bringing out some sort of high level ones that might apply. So if you knowingly have EU persons using your services, that's pretty clear cut that there's at least a potential there. If you collaborate a lot with EU persons or EU facilities and there's data sharing that happens there, that's another one that you say, okay, we're probably handling some data and it looks like we are offering goods or services. If you were doing research on EU persons, right, this goes back to that monitoring point, 
or even if you're just you know receiving data that includes EU persons. So you might be monitoring the whole world, but in that you are also monitoring the EU. Well, you're monitoring the EU, and so you're probably covered. Um, maybe if you just want to collaborate with EU facilities in the future, there is this potential that they might ask you about whether or not you're compliant with the law. And uh, finally, you know, if there might just be some U.S. stakeholder who is just interested in GDPR. They might say, well, we're taking privacy more seriously. We would want to know. And so it could indirectly be applied to you as well. I, sorry, I got another question here. Sure. Are NetFlow records, uh, which result from the activity of EU citizens in the US covered? Okay, so again, like I said, there's a lot of uncertainty with regard to this. I will say, so I don't know, I don't know definitively the answer to that question. In general, what we are talking about is, uh, when we talk about uh, data on data subjects that's going to be covered, it's any data that can basically reveal something about the identity of that person. So there's a lot of stuff that's covered in these definitions. Um, I'm, I, might, I might pull out and uh, show you some of these definitions because it might help. But things like IP addresses are covered because with an IP address, you know something specific about that person. If it doesn't seem like you can sort of like glean information about the person from the data that you are doing processing on, that is much less likely to be covered, right? There's sort of this, if you think about it as almost like identifiability, if you can identify a person from the data, it is much more likely to be covered. And on the next question I just saw, I don't think uh, US agencies are asking for GDPR compliance. I know that they came up in uh, when uh, Zuckerberg was uh, before Congress. I haven't heard of any uh, US organizations, you know, those sort of like regulatory bodies really looking at uh, GDPR compliance in a serious way. I will say one of the uh, potential future scenarios might be that there is an agreement between the US and the EU. This is what happened with the previous law, where the US sort of has like a GDPR light that organizations can self-certify to. This is what happened with um, Privacy Shield or the, uh, whatever it was called beforehand, the Safe Harbor sorry, that um, the U.S. basically saw this was impacting U.S. companies and they figured something out so that like the FTC really became the regulatory body. Okay. So, uh, and, and one more. We got one in the chat here. Okay. Uh, question one, example, Science Gateway, uh, no money involved, strictly to support researchers providing processing or analysis of user provided data, store email, IP address, user's chosen username, credentials, and log of jobs run by the user and data uploaded by user. Is this covered? And then there's a second question. Okay, um, right, let, me, let me see if I can pull up the question. Okay, so the no money involved part, uh, unfortunately, is not, a, uh, it's not a hard barrier. You know? So there can be no money involved, but if it's still offering a good or service to the EU, then it would there's still potential, at least that'll be covered. Um, support researchers, uh, processing analysis, user provided data. Yeah, so I, I don't have the answer to your question. At the end of this, I've got a great slide that just says, if you were uncertain, you should talk to counsel, right? This is always the sort of the lawyer answer to everything is, if you were really concerned, you should talk to someone and you know they can really work with you on an individualized basis. I will say it's certainly possible, right? If it looks like there's some, there's a, some personal data here. We're talking about you know, emails, IP addresses, um, usernames, credentials. I mean, a lot of these things would count as personal data. So really then it would come down to, would they say you're offering goods or services to the EU in a way that you really envisage it, right? Are you sort of thinking, yes, the EU is like sort of like one of my targets. Particularly, I think they might say, if. Like the EU is that in a way that maybe other countries are not, or other countries, you know, regions are not. So if you say, we're, th we're expecting to get researchers from the EU, we're really not expecting to get researchers from, you know, Asia or something like that. That might look like you're really envisaging. envisaging. But again, I don't have a specific answer. This is something that's going to probably be raised a lot. Hopefully we'll get some clarity in the coming months.
And is there an EU contract personal organization can ask for clarifications? That is a good question that I unfortunately don't have a good answer. I'm not sure that there is a single EU contact because I think there's just a lot of uncertainty. I will say there's, I give you some resources at the end of places to sort of watch that you can look at. In general, looking at things like the European uh, Commission or the European Council, like they've got a bunch of regulatory bodies that give out sort of like updated guidance. Also, there are a lot of privacy lawyers who work in the EU who this is going to be their whole life. So they will probably be fielding lots of very specific questions. So I would also say just reaching out to client, you know, to counsel here in the States, and then they might reach out to counsel overseas is another option. Okay, so getting on to the final section, then I can go straight into questions. Um, and this is just strategies. Basically, what you should do, or what you maybe could do, if you think you are covered, right? You've gone to all this and you say, I'm a little concerned, what are some things I can think about? So strategy number one, uh, these are, sorry for the, uh, the sort of cheeky names, the Nike method, you know, just do it. Just, just do the law, right? It sounds messy, it sounds hard, it's expensive, but you could just try and go for full compliance, right? You, maybe you'll get some kudos, you know, you're, you're respecting privacy in a great way. You can maybe turn that into a selling point. This is probably also the most unappealing of the options, right? Because it, it's expensive, it's time consuming. Uh, there's so much uncertainty that you're not even sure, even if you try to do it right, that you're necessarily doing it right. So, but that's an option, right? Especially if you're a larger organization, you might, you might have the resources. I mean, and then there's also like, you know, the Facebooks and the Googles where it, clearly, you know, the Nike method is what they should be doing. Okay, so the second method is sort of the total inverse of that. I call it the Clint Eastwood method, you know, make my day. And that's just completely ignore it. And I'm not actually advising you to disregard laws, right? That would be pretty unethical. What I'm actually saying here is that the European Union is being unusually uh, proactive in their attempt to regulate sort of the world. I mean, they're really not regulating the world, they're regulating EU person's data, but their uh, approach to jurisdiction actually doesn't jive very well with the US approach to jurisdiction. And so you can legitimately say, I just don't think I'm covered by this, even if you think that you think, uh, even if you think that I am. So they can say they want to regulate you, but that doesn't actually necessarily give them the authority. Uh, so I'm going to kind of skip over uh, some of the, the legal discussion here. But basically, we have competing uh, claims for sovereignty here, where the U.S. has an interest in regulating U.S. people, and the EU has an interest in regulating EU people. And they're sort of reaching a little bit further than they normally would. And I think, I'm pretty sure that the U.S. would, if they, um, if the, if they tried to enforce this, that the U.S. might just not go along with it. So the way this kind of works is at a practical level, is if you don't have assets in the EU, right, you don't have like money stored there, something like that. If they try and bring a judgment in European Union court, there's nothing the European Union court can do. So what they would have to do is bring the judgment to a US court. And in the US court, they would apply US rules about jurisdiction, about standing. And I think it's very unlikely that a claim would go, would give rise, or at least there's a much stronger chance than uh, if you applied sort of like the European Union perspective, we would have like much more uh, stringent requirements on harm, say. And so it's much more likely that this law actually wouldn't apply to you, even if the EU wants it to. So that's what's good. That's what's going on here with the Clint Eastwood method. Now I will say this is also kind of a risky method because if you say want to collaborate with the European with people in the European Union, that can make this much more difficult. It also could it'd be straining tensions potentially, but there is um, there's legitimate you know legal basis for taking an approach like this. Now I will say this also re um, relies uh, to a great deal on what specifically you are doing. So if you are taking actions that the U.S. would agree gives the EU jurisdiction over you, then that might be treated differently, right? They might extradite you or, or something along those lines. But this is a, a potential ground, particularly for smaller organizations who really only have business dealings in the sort of U.S. sense in the EU. And then the third option is the one that I feel like I've seen the most of when I sort of see people talk about the sort of practical approach. And that's this kind of wishy-washy middle ground, 
where they sort of acknowledge that GDPR probably applies to them. But they maybe don't say that explicitly. They sort of, you know, they look at it and they start making some changes. They, uh, you might begin to implement some of the requirements of the law, but you're sort of not going full bore at it. You know, you're doing bit by bit as it makes sense, trying to tackle some of the easy, low hanging fruit stuff first. And the kind of mentality here is that even though this law sort of like technically could apply to you, there's this big practical consideration of who, what is this law really trying to do? And when you think about what it's really trying to do, it is trying to regulate the organizations that have a major impact on privacy. And so if you are not one of those organizations that has like a really major impact on privacy, you are just not the target of this law. Right? You are not Facebook or you are not Google or Amazon, you know, any of these big tech companies whose decisions really do have a profound impact on people's privacy. And so you're sort of trying to find this, you know, again, this middle ground of doing what you need to do, but also not breaking the bank for something that's really not about you. And this is a difficult one to sort of figure out what's right for you. It's going to deal a lot with like your organizational risk tolerance, perhaps. But it's something I think I see a lot of organizations doing, particularly because if you look at some of the sort of like the uh, news reporting on this, there's a sense that no one's really ready for this law, right? Even the companies who are like the best situated and have the resources to do it, they're still not ready. And the other sort of middle ground option here is partnering with international organizations. So if you, you're like based in the US, I'm assuming most of the audience here is based in the US, you can just find a partner in the EU and ask them to deal with all of your EU person's data processing needs. Where you can just say, you know what, I'm just gonna throw it over there and then I don't have to deal with it, right? They'll just handle all of the, uh, the messy details. It's sort of like using you know, Amazon cloud providers where you can just say, I don't have the resources to comply with some of the, uh, you know, like the US requirements even, like under FISMA, but Amazon has some cloud space that does all of that for me. And so you see some of this um, in a lot of different contexts where like Microsoft will employ a German data processor to deal with their German data processing needs. They're contracted to Microsoft, but the, uh, the company is actually dealing with all of these issues. And then the sort of final thing is you can just kind of cut off ties and say, you know, delete all EU person's data. You just don't collect EU person's data. And if you're not processing EU person's data, then you're not covered by the law. That's pretty clear. And again, whichever option you choose will depend on factual questions. You know, it's going to be based on your contacts with the EU, your organizational risk tolerance, and as always, you should talk to counsel if you have serious questions or concerns. And with that, I will open the floor to questions. Sorry, I went a little bit longer than I intended. That's okay. We had some really good questions, so, uh, and we've got some time left. Uh, it looks like we've got another question here. Um, the difficulty with trying to throw EU person issues to some other org is, if I understand it, that US people working overseas need to be taken into consideration as well. So it's not black and white on the partition. Is that correct? Um, US people working overseas need to be taken into consideration as well. Kind of. Uh, I think this could still be resolved though. So if you recall, when we talked about um, EU persons, it wasn't EU citizens, right? It was um, people in the EU. So it could be a US person in the EU is covered by the law. But, as, but only with regard to the, um, you know, the collection and processing relative to offering of goods and services or monitoring of data. So again, this gets a little bit confusing, but if you were like a US person, you normally live in the EU, I mean, you don't normally live in the US, I'm sorry. And so like Facebook monitors me, Google monitors me, like a bunch of companies do. If I go over into the EU, all that other old stuff doesn't suddenly magically shift over. Now it's everything is GDPR covered. But there's like this time gap where it's like, I, I step foot in the EU on Monday morning and all of the offering of goods and services and the monitoring of data that happens from that point on is GDPR covered but it would also be being collected through, you know, different means. You know, it would be going through probably, I'm not sure if Facebook has like a, you know, a German version. I, I haven't experienced this personally, but there would be, there's a clear divide 
And if you were a U.S. person working overseas long term, then yes, you would be covered. You know, your data would be lumped in with other EU person data. But you could still potentially have that data be shifted over to be covered by a sort of European affiliate. I think that still potentially works. Okay, more questions. Um, yep. If a cloud tenant deploys a service in the cloud to serve subjects in the EU, who's going to coordinate the efforts from the cloud provider and the tenant to ensure GDPR compliance? Okay, that's a good question. And um, so this kind of goes back, I think, to the definitions that they use for data controllers and data processors. Generally, the way this works is this is sort of um, the, uh, the, simple answer, or the simple definitions, I would say, is the data controller is the person who calls the shots. The data processors are the ones who carry out the shots. So if you are just a person, but you stand up like a cloud service, and that cloud service is off, and your intent with standing up that cloud service is to offer subjects in the EU, then you are the data controller still, right? The cloud tenant is just a provider, and they're just a processor. They're kind of doing what you tell them to. So it would be up to you to negotiate GDPR compliance. Now, most likely the cloud providers, they're big companies, they know that these issues are going to arise, they'll probably take a proactive stance on it. So like, if you, I imagine if you contact with like, you know, Amazon uh, Web Services, they will raise these types of issues. But it will be somewhat a negotiation, I imagine. Although if you are negotiating with Amazon, chances are Amazon is probably calling the shots. But again, a, a very good question. And it, it kind of goes to this uh, difficulty in determining who's calling the shots, who's doing data processing, what is actually, because I mean, a lot of times those things, those can be collapsed into one where the controller is the processor. But a lot of times they really spread out where you're one data controller, but you have a lot of like sub processors and those processors might have sub processors, but you are still the ultimate controller. So hopefully I answered that question. Um, Asking about the NSF, we kind of review it directly. I'm not sure if people can see those questions, so okay. would you mind reading okay. it out loud? All right, so this is an FYI about, so someone asked earlier about it, whether the NSF or other U.S. organizations, or, you know, sort of like U.S. regulatory bodies were considering GDPR compliance. And um, so they contacted their NSF uh, P, uh, program officer and uh, asking about, I think, network flow diagrams, it sounds like, but that would be identified. And uh, the NSF didn't have written guidelines yet, which I think makes sense. I doubt any U.S. organization has a really clear vision on how they should approach GDPR at this point. I think that it, but I would say as sort of a, a generalized recommendation is that I would like to see more clarity on this sort of EU-US uh, application question. And in the past, there was a lot of, you know, the tech sector basically said, we want more certainty on this issue. They went to their representatives, they went to Congress, and then Congress sort of like says, okay, well, you know, let's get, we'll just get the State Department to negotiate. And they eventually came up with this international agreement, which was, like I said, it was the safe harbor, which then became the privacy shield, where we sort of found like a middle ground between a total US approach and a total EU approach. And actually the privacy shield probably still exists at least for the next four days. I'm not sure exactly what's going to happen with that once GDPR comes into effect, I would guess it's superseded. But pushing for something like that is something that I think would make a lot of sense. So if you have particular context in say the NSF, that voicing your concerns that we would like more clarity on this, and that one thing they could do is try to push for maybe like the State Department to you know, work out some diplomatic solutions to this problem. But uh, thanks for the FYI. Okay, we've got a couple minutes left. So if you have questions, you can just go ahead and type them in the chat or we're, we're also utilizing this Q&A form. Um, while I have your attention, I just, pop, I just popped in a link to our survey for this webinar this month. We appreciate the feedback. And if you have any topics that you'd like to hear more about in, in future webinars, please let us know in the comments so we can help give you the information that you, you folks need. Um, I'm just going to keep talking for a couple more minutes to let people type questions if they have them.
Uh, here we go. We've got another one here. Will Brexit have any effect on GDPR? Um, yes, to some extent. Uh, basically, if you were collecting, uh, well, so part of this depends on if what negotiations actually happen with Brexit. So that's going to be complicated. They might, there might be something, I mean, if there's some sort of like super EU bodies that, um, where you have like the, uh, was the Schengen area where there's these broader economic agreements. So it's unclear exactly whether um, uh, basically the UK will still be considered um, EU persons or not. So there's a chance that it might be, uh, if you were collecting data on people from Germany or France, then you're covered. But if you're collecting data on people in England, then you're not covered. But that, again, that's sort of something that we'll have to see based on how the Brexit process goes. That's something I haven't been following as closely, but I would guess that's how that would generally apply. Um, all right, so the next question is, what about data that has been collected in the past, say two years ago, but still is used, but has not been updated? For instance, if you have users in your user authentication database from years ago, do they need to be purged? All right, this is a very good question that I unfortunately don't know the answer to. Um, I don't recall, I've read through the whole law in some detail. I don't recall any provision about this sort of like grandfathering potential issue. I would guess because I, they don't have anything specific about it that it is covered because it is still user data, but I'm not sure. I, I'll, I'll have to earmark that one. I might be able to follow up. Um, is there a particular U.S. agency to expect to provide guidelines to U.S. companies? Uh, I would imagine several could potentially. Uh, the most likely would be the FTC uh, as sort of a general purpose regulator the, under the uh, Privacy Shield and the uh, Safe Harbor. It was uh, the FTC that would put out guidance on these types of issues. But it also depends on your sector. So if you if your regulator is not the FTC, or if you are under like the... Uh, FAA or something like that, um, then those would be the ones who would likely uh, provide you guidance on these types of regulations. And um, if you like, if you um, are subject to like NSF grant type issues, you know, you're like you are on an NSF grant and, and they are sort of like, maybe not your regulator, but your like go-to person, I would hope that they would put something out. It probably will not be in the next three days, I would guess, if they haven't already. Well, if they do give out something, it'll be sort of like leading to something much broader in the future. Uh, Scott, can we've got still a few more questions coming in. Can we keep you for a few more minutes? Yeah, sure. Okay, so uh, go ahead and pick on the next one, please. Okay. Uh, do you have any examples of a consent form? Is there a time limit when one would have to get a new consent? Um, there are examples of uh, consent forms. You can find them online. I don't have any on hand, unfortunately, but uh, there, there's a lot of sort of form stuff like this. I mean, another example is you could probably just look on Facebook and Facebook will have um, a pretty good example of like what the sort of consent banner would look like. The law gives you some pretty uh, in-depth details. One second, let me, uh, you should be able to see my screen. So you're also seeing the questions now. Um, yep, I can see your screen. So if we go to, let's see, I'm going to try and do this quickly. Petitions for consent. So this is the, this is the law's general provisions about consent. So this was obviously like the go-to if you were looking for like what should um, be uh, covered under consent. Again, there are going to be more specific examples online. I can, I can try and pull one up and point you to it, but ultimately, I think th those shouldn't be too hard to find, I would hope. Um, and, and I think the second part of that question was about um, old consent. And so I, this, this kind of goes back, I'm, I'm reading this now under subsection three, that um, you have a right to withdraw consent at any time. Um, if you have old data though, and it was never consented to in the first place, then that would still present a problem. But if they did consent to it and they just haven't revoked it, then that should probably still be okay, provided that you would still have to, you know, 
give them the option to withdraw their consent. Uh, does GDPR flow downstream? I can bring your questions up so people can actually see them, or maybe that's not a good idea. Uh, GDPR flow downstream to your business associates that you are using, e.g. Amazon. So this is, a, this is another very good question. There, um, in general, there are contract clauses that organizations are supposed to use. This was sort of in like the certifications and the transfer restrictions I talked about that I, I largely skipped over because they're pretty in-depth. But um, the short answer is maybe. And so if you have, you know, if you have uh, business associates that are doing processing of EU person's data, then yes, that would still be covered. If you just have business associates and, you know, some of them maybe have to do with EU data and some don't, then it would just be based off of sort of, it would go back to the scope question, basically. You know, are they processing? And um, this is another issue that's going to be clarified more by the data protection authorities as um, they come out with much more specific guidelines on say like what these contract clauses should look like. So like under the safe harbor, the previous regime or under the, I'm sorry, the data protection directive, there were uh, model contract clauses or, uh, and uh, there's another term that I'm now blanking on, but basically in your agreements, there's like model agreements that you follow and those spell out in detail what your sort of downstream business associates have to do. So I don't have super clear answer, but that's, that is definitely something that we'll be able to find pretty clearly in the future. Um, all right, next question. How much room is there for gradual adoption slash compliance? Yeah, this is one, the law doesn't say anywhere that, um, you know, we're gonna be lenient on you sort of the uh, implication that people who look into it say, yes, but, you know, we think that they're going to be more lenient if you are still kind of trying to get up to speed because so many people are struggling with this. So this kind of goes back to the, uh, again, the middle ground, if you remember in the GDPR strategies, where if you are working on it, you're like kind of making a good faith effort, then you might get sort of like slapped on the wrist but there's a lot of discretion imbued in these sort of penalties. So they might not impose any penalties on you or maybe they'd be very minor. So hopefully, you know, they would you know, be lenient in that regard, but there's no guarantee. I mean, technically organizations have known about this. The law has been published in its totality for two years. You know, that was when it was adopted and they just put in a two year, uh, you know, grace period or not a grace period, but they set the actual date of application in 2018, even though it passed in 2016, to try and give people time to, you know, actually implement the requirements. Unfortunately, I think most people waited until the last minute, you know, bringing back memories of being a student. Um, so I wouldn't, I would say there's probably not a risk at large penalties starting on uh, May 25th. So this Friday is when it comes into effect. But um, yeah, like I said, yeah, I see you ask. Um, but there's potential. I mean, if, if on uh, day one, they, uh, they see Facebook doing some really egregious stuff that they don't like, they might try and bring some large penalties. So hopefully not, but it's hard to say, you know, again, it's, it's the problem whenever the enforcement agency has discretion is that they can use that discretion and it's often not to your favor. Okay. Well, let's do one last question call for one more question um but in the meantime um scott are you available to answer things offline yes okay. um i think my slides should have my email address yeah on the very first slide okay so feel free to reach out with any specific questions although i will say there's a good chance that if it's very specific my answer will be you know you should talk to you should try to hire like a lawyer Right. Right. Okay. Well, I, I think we've, we've addressed all the immediate questions. Um, and so I really want to thank you so much for this presentation. And I think you are helping our community tremendously just by informing them about uh, GDPR and what their liabilities are. And uh, with that, uh, I think I'll uh, just thank you again and I'll stop recording here.